welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. Tonight I want to share with you a simple principle Debbie and I have been talking about a lot lately. The principle of dealing with disappointments. There's a way to deal with disappointments that a lot of people don't understand and it's really basically very simple. In fact, when we get into the weekends, uh, after Easter, we're going back to Hebrews, the end of the third chapter, and the beginning of the fourth chapter, we're going to be talking about rest. Sounds funny, the word rest, because it doesn't seem to be very important. But it's so important that you work all of your life, day in and day out, usually a 40-hour week for some of your own businesses, even more than that. To get into a place of rest when rest is available to you every day in Christ Jesus. And it's so simple and so wonderful, but we'll get into the depth of that. But tonight we're just talking about dealing with disappointments. Everybody has disappointments. I don't care who you are. You can be the strongest Christian, know all the scripture, quote everything that you're going to quote, preach the gospel around the world, you will still be at times frustrated with way and situations of life and be disappointed in life. Some of you recently have lost jobs and haven't been able to get jobs. Some of you have lost homes. You know people that have lost homes. Some of you lost family members. Some of you have gone through divorces, which is sad in itself. And some of you had promises from people that let you down. And, you know, life just at times can be incredibly discouraging. So discouraging if you don't know what to do, what you will do is you will run from God, angry at God, saying to yourself, why didn't God help me in this situation? And then you'll find that many people who used to go to church five and six and seven years ago no longer go to church because no one taught them how to handle the problems that come at all of us. Stop and think about it in the Bible for a second. I mean, just think about it just for a moment. For an example, Moses. I mean, how disappointing Moses must have been that he has brought the children of Israel out of the bondage of Egypt and then to walk into the wilderness with them free with signs, wonders, and miracles and the promise of God ahead of him of the promised land that was full of milk and honey and just to find out that he wasn't going to go into it because he had made a mistake. How disappointing must that have been to him? I want to say this to you. Sometimes we're disappointed because God doesn't respond the way we think God ought to respond. Sometimes we're disappointed because we pray a lot, but we don't see any results of our prayer. Sometimes we're disappointed because we don't think God really cares at all. Sometimes we don't get the response that we need. And you need to hear this. Oftentimes in Scripture you will find it because we're just out of place with God. Sometimes we're out of sync with God. Sometimes we're in a place of sin. Sometimes we're in a place where we don't need to be. And if God blesses us where we're at, when we're out of sync with God, we will stay out of sync with God, thinking that's a good place and it's the right place to be. So God withholds the blessings. You'll find that over and over and over again. So the first thing you got to do to deal with disappointment is, number one, I don't want to go there, and this is not really a point for tonight. It's just something for you to check yourself out. Make sure you're right with God. Because if you're not right with God, can I tell you something? You're going to be disappointed by the world and people and situations and trials and tribulations all the days of your life. But if you're right with God, that's different. Then something can happen. Moses found himself in a place where he was just disappointed. I was thinking about it the other day. How about Joseph? Here God gives him a vision of the future, which is pretty dynamic. And instead of that vision of the future coming to pass that God gave to him, years are going to go by and he's going to spend them in a prison. And his ones that sold him out was his own family, his own brothers sold him out so that he ends up in prison. How discouraging is that? But let me tell you something, in the midst of that kind of a discouragement where your family sells you out and God gives you a promise, but you don't see the promise, you see the exact opposite of what God has given you. May I say this to you, all of us would want to quit thinking we didn't hear from God the right way. I know I would. And yet you'll see at the end of his life, 
God literally turns everything around. He goes from the, from the pit to the palace, from the prison to the palace. And everything that God said came to pass, but it didn't come to pass during that period of time of disappointment. Sometimes with disappointment, it's a test, it's a trial to see what you're going to do, whether you're going to stay in with God during those pressure times, or are you going to back off and start accusing God and start complaining about who God is? And sometimes we need to look at ourselves and see where we're really at. How about, for an example, David? David, stop and think about David for a moment. Here comes the great Samuel, the prophet. He anoints David to be king over Israel. Saul had completely failed and everybody knew it. And here's this young boy on the hills of Judea and he is called off the hills and here's the, the great man of God, Samuel the prophet, and anoints him to be king over Israel. I would have thought that he would have instantaneously gone and been the king, but it didn't happen that way. For years he has to run for his life. Even to the place where he was so messed up, he didn't know where he was at times and made a lot of, I believe, horrible mistakes. And yet we'll find what a disappointment that must have been to David. I don't understand that he must have said to himself, the great Samuel anointed me to be king. I went out and God helped my hand to slay the giant Goliath. And everybody thought of me as great and was ready to accept me as a king. They sang songs about me. I was ready to take that step forward. It was going to happen in my life. And then all of a sudden it does not happen. That's disappointment. It happens to you. God's promised you things and hasn't come to pass, and you know it. And you actually have gotten to the place where you don't even want to think about it anymore, and you just want to put it aside, and you want to get rid of it, thinking that you've missed God. Here's my question to you. What if you didn't miss God? What if you heard from God and it just, like David, hasn't come to pass yet? What if you heard from God like Joseph and it just hadn't come to pass yet? What if you heard from God and, and, and just like Moses, you're not the one that's going to do it, but it's going to happen to the children of Israel, which you brought out and were part of. And it wasn't for you, they wouldn't have still been in bondage. Stop and think about Paul for an example. If you talk about disappointment, Paul the apostle, the writer of two-thirds of the New Testament, what's that all about? His life should have been pretty cool. I mean, God meets him on the road to Damascus. Remember that? God blinds him and then speaks to him. He knows what's going on. He knows what's ahead of him. God said, I'm sending you out there. You're going to be a witness to those Gentiles. You're going to start these things. You're going to tell people about me and the things about me. Then he goes and he says, listen to this. And then he gets thrown in prison. You know, most of the time Paul spends in jail. What's that all about? I mean, how'd you like to have a mandate from God to go tell the world about the grace of God? He was the one that brought the time period or dispensation of grace in. And God says, here's what I want you to do. For 14 years, God had trained him to bring the dispensation of the grace of God in. And then all of a sudden, he finds himself in prison. What's that all about? You talk about disappointment, my friends. <coughs> We're not any different than these people. These were great men and women of God that had gone before us. And may I say this to you? They face disappointments just like you do. The question is whether or not we're going to get a hold of those disappointments and go through them or those disappointments are going to get a hold of us and stop us. And for all of us that are in here, that's where the rubber really meets the road as to whether or not chapter number two or three or four in your life starts to take place. And that's where we'll talk about rest at a different time when you're under pressure. Remember I talked to you just for a moment about David before he becomes king of Israel. I, I was teaching in a Bible class many times and as I was teaching, I'm sharing about David and how he has literally just fallen apart. Saul, the king, is chasing him. He's jealous. He's crazy. He's going after demons and devils and witches, telling him what to do. And he's trying to kill David because David is his competition for the kingship, if you will, of Israel. David's running for his life over and over and over and over again. And people are really against David, trying to kill him. And he finds himself in a place where he's in the wilderness and he runs literally to the king of Goliath's hometown. Remember Goliath was a giant that he kills? He goes back to the hometown of Goliath to try to find some sanctuary where he could be safe. 
And there he kind of turns himself over. And a lot of Bible theologians say he turned himself over, but really he would have turned. It's all assumption. Can I tell you something? According to the scripture, he turned himself over to the enemy of Israel. He had totally gone in the wrong direction. I really believe that. I really believe that he made a horrible mistake and he was in such despair. He was so disappointed in life. He had heard that God was going to make him king and he had run year after year for his life. Things couldn't have been worse. He was blessed as a, a, a young man in his wealthy father's house and now he has nothing. And now nothing works for him at all and he's totally discouraged. And you will find that literally something takes place that shocks him back to God. Sometimes we have to find God. Listen, not that God's lost. He's just lost in our despair and disappointments, discouragements. Lost in our thinking, lost in our foolishness. And sometimes we have to find God and bring him back every day of our life. So that we can glean from him the life we need during times of disappointment. Is anybody listening? Go with me, if you will, in 1 Samuel, the 30th chapter. In 1 Samuel, the 30th chapter, verse number 6, here we find David. And by the way, in the 30th chapter, you'll find that three chapters, three or two or three chapters before this, never mentions God one time, talks about David's life, but never talked about David and God. God was like out of the scene with David. And all of a sudden, after this horrible despair of discouragement, at this particular time of his life, then David finally finds God again and gets back to God. This is the first time God's mentioned in David's life for chapters. And it's so fascinating because in verse number 6, everything is lost in David's life. His, his men have been rejected. He's been rejected from the enemies of Israel. He comes back to his camp and his camp is all the women are stolen. All the children are stolen. All the goods are stolen. Everything's gone and his, and his men want to kill him. He's off to such a bad day. What a disappointing time. In verse number 6 of the 30th chapter of 1 Samuel says this, And David was greatly distressed. For the people spoke of stoning him instead of loving him and singing songs about him. Instead of exalting him and lifting him up and believing and having confidence in him, they find him in a place where they're now thinking about and talking about stoning him. Because of the souls of all the people were grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters then David does something, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Let me ask you a question. As a pastor who loves you very much and wants to see the very best in your life, wants to see your children successful, and I so desire you to make it in business and make it in your marriage, someone who just simply loves you, what could I do in the midst of distress and disappointment to get you to run back and find God in your life. Instead of just coming along to you, number one thing I could do is I could say, well, you need to strengthen yourself in him and in the Lord, which brings us to three things that God gave me to give to you so that you can find God in those times of despair and Disappointment. Is that all right? Listen to these three things that are so simple. I call it like this. When dealing with disappointments, number one, find God as your strength, just like David did. You've got to find that God is your strength, not you, not people, not the politicians, not the economy, not your job, not people around you. People will always let you down. That's why we put our trust in God. But guess what? You will have to find that there's a strength that comes on the inside of you, and it cannot come to you until you get hooked up and find who God is. In the midst of a problem, we're looking everywhere else. Maybe we can get a check from our aunt. Maybe our mother will loan us money. Maybe we'll get a new job. Maybe we'll do this. But first thing first, you're going to have to find your strength in the Lord. Because there's none other. 
The bottom line is when God is on your side, and who in the heck cares who's against you? Because they've got to listen to this. They've got to go through God to get to you. And when you have covenant with God, all that God has is yours, and all that you have is God. And that's what a covenant is really all about. So therefore, the very strength of God now belongs to you. You've got to get back and find it. Because what you'll do is you'll find all the reasons why. Have you ever noticed that, to be disappointed? Well, I failed at this, and I failed at that, and I prayed once, and there wasn't an answer, and, and they let me down, and it doesn't look like anybody cares, and I'm out by myself, and I'm not going. You will find all kinds of reasons to justify why you give up on God. But here you're going to find that the only thing that's important is that you find your strength, your strength in his strength and from his strength. Without it, it just doesn't work. In Romans, the 16th chapter, go there with me, let's check it out for ourselves. In Romans, the 16th chapter, verse number 25. I'm going to read it to you out of the new King James, and then I'm going to come back and show you on the overhead the old King James, because it... I think he even says it better out of the old King James. It says, now to him who is able. You see the word able? The word able means has the strength, has the strength of God. To him, notice the capital H on the word him. Speaking of God, to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began. Let me tell you something, saints. In other words, what God says in the word of God, he's able to hold you in place and keep you strong. And the strength of God will back you just by what it said. Now listen to the old King James. Some of you might have the old King James version. It says this, now to him is of power to establish you according to my gospel. Paul was so intimate with the word of God that he called it my gospel. If I stood up here tonight and I said to you, I said, my brothers and sisters, I want to preach to you my gospel. Some of you had ripped the chairs right out of the floor and hit me in the head with it. But notice how Paul the apostle describes the word of God as his. You and I are going to have to get to the place where the word of God is personal. It's not just for somebody else. It's for me. It's my gospel. Are you following me? And that's a relationship that all of us build on, and that's a relationship we all can do. We can start determining in our hearts that the Word of God, who can establish us, that our strength comes from Him and what He has to say. Is anybody listening? So number one, when dealing with disappointment, you're going to find your God as your strength. Number two, you're going to have to find grace as your power. Finding grace as your power. Remember, here we have a little saying about grace. Some of you know it, some of you don't, but we're going to keep pumping it until all of you know it. Grace is not just something that happens in favor from God that you didn't earn. It's a whole lot more than that. It is that, but more than that. Grace is literally, if you will, the ability of God getting in your behalf and getting the job done when you can't get it done. We say it like this, grace, the sovereign divine ability of God to, 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 to do what? To get the job done on my behalf when I can't do it. It's God's sovereign divine ability. I need God's ability. I can't do it on my own. I need God to open the doors. I need God to close the doors. I need God to make a way where there is no way. When I can't do it, can't figure out how to do it, it's the grace of God that comes in and gets the job done. It's God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on my behalf when I can't do it. What I put in is everything I can, and then God puts in everything he can, and now you find yourself getting the job done. And that's called grace. Without an understanding of grace, when you're facing with disappointment, you'll look everywhere else 
You'll try to find it in everything. You'll try to find it in a Cracker Jack box. You'll try to find some help from your neighbors and relatives and friends. You'll try to find encouragement from this or that. Thank God you'll, you'll vote certain people in just to get things instead of voting ones in that'll help you to be successful in life. God wants us to realize this is his grace that makes the difference. I need his grace every day. I don't know how I'm going to make it. I don't feel like I can make it. I don't feel like I'm smart enough. I don't feel like I'm talented enough. I don't feel like I have enough ability. I don't feel like I'm gifted enough. How am I going to do this? I'll tell you how it's going to get done. It's going to get done by the grace of God. And I've got to find the grace of God every day. Because every day something discouraging, something disappointing wants to knock on my heart. There's a negative outreach that wants to come and tell you you can't, tell you you're no good, tell you you can't make it, tell you you're a loser, tell you nobody cares. There's somebody always wanting to put you down. I'm telling you right now, you have an enemy not only in the spirit realm, but sometimes you have enemies even in the physical realm. And I want you to know something, you're going to get the job done that's ahead of you by the grace of God never forget it and you have to find every day you have to find the grace when I get up in the morning you know as an old man I get up and, I, and things don't work like they used to work I, I, I kind of walk like Frankenstein that got out of the bed. You ever, ever see those old movies of Frank? That's me getting out of bed in the morning. How am I going to make it? Here's how. Grace of God will make it and wake away for me. Some of you are not very smart. People told you you can't make it. The, the, the school teachers told you you were losers. The sergeant in the army said you couldn't make it. Your job, you got you know disappointed by your job. They kicked you off, fired you. You're down. I want you to know something. You can be anything God has you to be as long as you're in there. All things are possible to him that believes and it's the grace of God that makes it work. You will be say and do all that you're going to be say and do in the future by the grace of God. You just got to find the grace of God. And I find these wonderful verses that I've used a hundred times and I'm going to use them a thousand more times because we all need to hear it. I'll just pop it up on the overhead for you if I may. It's in 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, verse number 8. Paul is being buffeted. Buffeted means on a constant basis, stuff coming at him. Just constantly, like the waves of the sea breaking on the shore. Just constantly bad stuff coming at him. By a messenger of Satan, he says... And the Bible says that Paul prayed three times and asked God to remove the problem. Let me tell you something. I would have thought when Paul the Apostle prayed that God would have removed the problem. I would have thought that for sure. Surely Paul's got favor with God. Surely his prayers, you know, being so special man that he is, surely God hears him and would answer and get the devil off his back. Can I tell you something? God didn't get the devil off his back at all. Here's what God said about his prayers. Notice this in verse number 8. He says, and he said to me, my gospel is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So you see that when I'm weak, then his strength, my strength, is made perfect weakness. Here's what God said. God said, my grace is sufficient. My sovereign divine ability to get the job done. I'm not removing the problem. I'm giving you the power of God, the ability of God to get through the problem. Are you following this? My grace is sufficient. The sufficiency doesn't come by the removal of the problem. The sufficiency comes by the grace of God. Now, for many of you, you're facing disappointment, you're facing problems, and you want those problems to be removed, and then it's clear sailing. And sometimes God will do that. But there's other times you're going to have to grow up and realize that sufficient for your problem is the grace of God. His sovereign divine ability to get in and get the job done on your behalf when you can't do it. Notice about God what he says. My grace, notice the capital M and the word my, speaking of God. My grace is sufficient for you. For my, speaking of God, notice the capital M on the word my. For my strength is made perfect, where? In weakness. In other words, he's not saying my strength, God's strength is made perfect when you're strong. God's made perfect when you're weak. 
When you can't get the job done and you call upon the grace of God, then you guess what? God's strength is made now perfect. I don't know about you, but I want the strength of God to work on my behalf. I can't get the strength of God when I'm perfect. I get the strength of God when I realize I need his sovereign divine ability to get the job done on my behalf when I can't do it. Are you following me? Then he comes along in verse number, finish the verse, please. He says, my grace is sufficient. Therefore, Paul's writing, most gladly I would rather boast in my infirmities. See the word infirmities up there circulating in your Bible? It means weakness. It's not talking about sickness. He's talking about weakness. That's what he just got through saying. He says, I would rather boast in my weaknesses. Why? That the power of Christ may rest upon me. In other words, man, I'm telling you, when I'm weak, now I find the grace of God to help me get through the problem. Not to remove the problem so I have no problems, but guess what? Now I've got the grace of God that gets me through the problem. Are you following me? Now watch this. Go with me, if you will. Next verse. He says this. Therefore I take pleasure in my weakness, in reproaches, in needs, persecution, in distress... For Christ's sake, you put right in there also, disappointments. For Christ's sake, I can, be, I, can, I can take pleasure in it. I can take pleasure. Why is it that he could take pleasure when the problems come? Why is it that we're depressed? Why is it we're discouraged? Why is it we're disappointed? Why is it we want to give up? But yet here's Paul facing the problems, and now he says these words. He says, I take pleasure in them. Why would you take pleasure in problems? Here's why. He says, for when I'm weak, then I'm strong. What does he mean? When I finally realize I can't do it, but I find the grace of God that can do it. Now, I'm not strong. It's the grace of God that made me strong. Is anybody listening? And so in the midst of these disappointing times, which we all have, discouraging times, we can run from them, or we can find literally that our strength is in him, and now our ability to get through the problem and to be successful on the other side is found in his grace. We're looking at number three. Number three, then, is real interesting. Let's take a look at it. When dealing with disappointments, here's number three. Find hope from your trust. When I trust God, it gives me hope. You got to hear that again because sometimes we don't realize how important hope is. But hope also comes when I'm in the place of trusting God. That doesn't mean I have it. It just means I'm seeing it and I'm seeing it because now it's not based on me. It's based on him. Are you following me? When it's based on me, I get discouraged. When it's based on me, I lose hope. When it's based on me, I, I, I don't think I'm going to make it. When it's based on me, I'm depressed. When it's based on me, I'm definitely disappointed. But when it's based on him, now my hope. I've got to find hope from my trust. When I trust in him, now my hope comes into play. And when I have hope, man, hope says it won't make you ashamed when it's in the things of God. So tonight, here we see this in the word of the Lord. Let me just give you a verse. 2 Timothy, the first chapter, verse 12, says it like this. For this reason, I also suffer these things. In other words, Paul writes to Timothy and says, man, there's some things that come your way. I, they've come my way. And I want you to understand how to deal with them. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. In other words, my hope is in him because of who he is and the power he has. Today, you're facing disappointments. What you got to do is get off yourself and your ability. Get off of your answer and get on the answer of God. Three things today that'll help you when dealing with disappointments. Find God as your strength, just like David did. Two, now remember, you can sit around and mosey around all the time and never find God as your strength. You can look everywhere else, never find God as your strength. You've got to work at finding God 
as your strength. Number two, you got to find grace as your power. His ability to make the job and open the doors when you need them open when you can't open them. God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on your behalf when you can't do it. And number three, find hope in your trust. It's when you get back into faith in who God is that hope comes alive. It's not about me. It's not about getting something. It's not about having something. It's about God. God makes a way. All things are possible to him that believes. Nothing's impossible to him that believes. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So for every one of us, you get back in trusting God and hope builds in your life and in your heart. How to deal with disappointment won't be very long before God changes the circumstances that you're facing. If God spoke to you tonight, give the Lord a great big praise. We do that. Solid and healthy. Hey, I just want to make sure everybody's all right with God before you leave. Nobody get up, nobody leave. Let's talk just for a moment. I'll, I'll ask you a question. You answer the question in your heart. Nobody will know but you and God. Is that all right? Here's the question. If you were to walk out of this building tonight, your heart stopped and you died. Bang. You died. Whew. Horrible. Would you go to heaven? Or would you go to hell? And you say, well, pastor, what kind of a question is that? It's a blunt question. Would you go to heaven? Or would you go to hell? Your answer to that question says a lot about where you're at. You know, the Bible says that you should check yourself out from time to time to make sure you're okay with God. Answering that question is a good way to check yourself out. Where would you go if you died in the next few minutes, heaven or hell? Now, let's talk about your answer. Some of you might say, well, Pastor Jim, I think I would go to heaven if I died. I think I'd make it. Can I tell you something? Nowhere in the Bible does it say positive thinkers are going to get to heaven. You're not going to make it, and somebody needs to tell you. Some of you might say to yourself, well, Pastor Jim, hold on. I hope, my answer was, I hope that if I died, I'd go to heaven. Guess what? Nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to hope your way into heaven. You're not going to make it. And somebody needs to tell you. Some of you might have answered and said, well, wait a minute, Pastor Jim. I love God a whole lot. I'm going to go to heaven because I love God. Can I tell you something? I understand that. But nowhere in the Bible, again, not in the Bible, says you get to go to heaven because you say you love God. You're not going to make it. And somebody needs to tell you that. Nowhere in the Bible says you get to go to heaven because you love God. Listen, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. You know what he just really said? You can't make it to heaven your way, my way, or some well-meaning church committee's way. You're going to have to get to heaven his way. Now, don't you think the one, now watch this, a beaten, bloody mess on that cross at Calvary, nailed that cross, died on that cross, buried, raised from the dead on the third day, seated at the right hand of the Father, don't you think he'd tell you how to get to heaven? After all, he goes through all of that, and then he leaves it up to you to make up your, you know, whatever you think is okay, and whatever that group says is okay. And, you know, if they say that they want to come back as a frog and, and work their way up to be a turtle and then finally get to be a squirrel and then someday, you know, oh, come on. Don't treat God like he's an idiot. God's not an idiot, knows exactly what he's doing, and he tells us exactly in Scripture how to get to heaven. You might say, wait a minute, Pastor Jim. My mom and dad told me I was a Christian when I was a kid. I've always thought of myself as a Christian. Well, they take me to catechism class or Sunday school or Sabbath school class when I was a child, put a cross or St. Christopher around my neck when I was a child, had me christened or baptized when I was a baby. I've, I've always thought of myself as a Christian. Could you show me somewhere in the Bible that says... That'll get you to heaven because your mom and dad had those things they did for you and to you. Could you, could you show me that? It's not in the Bible. You're not going to make it and somebody needs to tell you. Listen to me. If Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, you better listen closely because that's the only way you're going to get to heaven. The only way any of us are going to get there is his way. And he comes and he tells us exactly in the scripture how to get to heaven. John 3rd chapter. He says this, he says, you must be born again. You must be born again. 
Now, a lot of people don't know what born again means. In fact, a lot of people in American churches don't like born again people. They've seen them on television. They look a little weird and strange. Movies have portrayed them as weirdos and fanatics. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus, when he made that statement, you must be born again, means something. Let me tell you what it means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. Here's what it means. It means you've given God all of your heart. It means you've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. It always has been. It always will be. All or nothing. That's what it means. And people who call themselves Christians, listen to this, that haven't given God all of their heart, haven't given God all their life, but call themselves Christians, are not going to make it. It's an all or nothing relationship, and I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking. He says, I'm coming again, and when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. You know what he just really said? People who call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all. And they're going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. So let's define for you what lukewarm is. Here's lukewarm, little in, little out, little up, little down. Token prayer, occasional church attendance. Watch this. You're not against God. No, no, you're not against him, but you're not wholehearted for him. God is something in your life, but he's not everything in your life. That's lukewarm, my friend. And you're going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. But tonight you can turn it around by giving God all of your heart and all of your life. Notice how I said giving. You know why I said giving? Because he's not a thief to rob it. It's your heart. He's not a conniver to talk you out of it or a manipulator to make you do it. He's not going to float around some cosmic cloud and hit you in the head with a two by four and make you give him your heart and life. Listen, if, do you think the one who created the heavens and earth, he could have made a trillion robots look just like you. All of them could worship him, sing songs to him. He didn't make a robot. He gave you a free will choice to choose him or not choose him, and it's your call. Wow. And tonight is your night of salvation. God has given you this opportunity to get right with him so you can call upon his strength. You can call upon his grace power, and you can call upon and have hope in him because you trust him. And tonight is your night of salvation. And if you haven't given him all of your heart and you haven't given him all of your life, then why not in this safe and friendly place? We've laughed, we've sung, we've clapped, we've shouted. You're great listening to the word of God. Why not tonight make it your night of salvation by giving God all of your heart and giving God all of your life? You say, Pastor Jim, how do I do that? Let's do it God's way. Let's don't do it my way or your way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up, and I'll see it. What you're saying by the raising of your hand is, I don't want Jesus in my head like most Americans. See, I already know you know who he is. You celebrate Christmas and Easter every year of your life. You know who Jesus is, but having head knowledge about who Jesus is will not get you to heaven and does not make you a Christian. Even the devil knows who Jesus is, and he's not going to heaven. It's not about your head. It's about your heart. Have you given him all of your heart? Have you given him all of your life? So when you hear my hands, pow, your hand goes up. And what you're saying by the raising of your hand is I'm giving him all of my heart, giving him all of my life. Being born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. I'm giving God my heart, giving Jesus my heart right now. And tonight will be your night of salvation. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your life, I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're not sure, make sure. Tonight is your night of salvation. Listen, you say, Pastor, you want me to raise my hand? I'll be embarrassed if I raise my hand. 
I don't know that I can do that. People I came with will see me. People behind me will see me. I'll feel funny. Can I tell you something? It's better to feel funny or be embarrassed in a safe place like this than to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever because you care more about what people think instead of what God sees. Come on, no one's that done. Get ready to pop your hand up and put it right back down. Let me see it. All across this auditorium, it's your night of salvation. I'm counting to three. I've done my job tonight. Here you go. It's your call. Ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Thank you. Back over on this side. Thank you. There's fourteen. There's fifteen. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody on this side? Anybody on this side? There's sixteen. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Real quick. Anybody else? Real quick. Didn't get your hand up. You know you should have. 60, 70. Got you. Go ahead. You can put your hand down. I see it. Go ahead and put it down. 60. There's 17. Thank you. Anybody else? Real quick. Anybody that didn't get their hand up? I, I don't want to count you twice. Anybody that didn't get your hand up but should have? You know you should have. Back in this family room. Back in this family room. Anybody else? Thank you. There's another one in the foyer. Thank you. God bless you in the foyer. There's 18. There's another one back here. Someone's pointing over here. Wave at me so I can see it wherever you're at. Oh, there you are, 18. There you are. Good, 19. Thank you. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else? If there's 19, can you just feel 20? Like, tw like, come on. Somebody needs to raise their hand here, and you know it. And I know you're number 20. Where are you? Anybody else real quick? Anybody else? They're pointing over here, way over here. Where are you? In the family room? Or back here. Oh, gotcha. Right back there. 20. Let's give the Lord a great. Oh, 21. All right. Cool. Great. 22. Now you're going. Now you're going. <laughs> cool. So good. Anybody else? Just come on. Here's what I want you to do. All of you that raised your hand, I want you to get all of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. Get your stuff. Get out of your seat. Yep, yep, get out of your seat. Get in the aisle. Meet me right here in front. No one leave during this period of time. Let's let these people come forward and get right with God. When you leave, it discourages people from coming forward. So if you raise your hand, you're serious, get down here. If you didn't raise your hand, but you know you should have, come on anyway. You can come too. Come on, come on, come on home. Come on. Oh, they're coming. Give them a hand as they come. Help me know you are near. Come on, give them a hand as they come. You come too. Come on. Oh, they're still coming. Give them a hand. You're all I want. You got good. Help me know you are here. There's more like 30 of you than 20. Well, thank God you guys have come. Real quick, I want you to look to your left. See this guy waving at you? His name's Pastor Dave. He's a really good guy. He's going to do three things. Let me tell you what they are so you don't get a frightened. Here are the three things. One, he's going to pray with you to invite Jesus into your heart. You need to invite Jesus into your heart. Number two, he's going to give you some free information about what to do next now that you're a Christian. Because when you pray, you're going to become a Christian. Now what does God expect from you? Just read through that little pamphlet. Simple third grade reading level. How do I know it's third grade? Because I wrote it. And so it'll be, uh, you know me, man, it's got to be simple if I'm in it. And so third grade reading level, it's really cool. And third thing he's going to do is introduce you to a friend. Uh, a friend, we give them away around here, called Spiritual Personal Trainers, S-P-T's. Spiritual Personal Trainer is somebody who will meet you before church service, buy you coffee, tea, nachos, encourage you in Jesus, 
pray for you during the week. Why, why, why would we do that? So you don't go back falling through the cracks with your old buddies, ending up in a bar, being flushed down the toilet when you could have lived a victorious life with Jesus. Let us help you. You said you're going to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Get back to church and let us help you meet your spiritual personal trainer. Only takes a few moments. Make a left turn. Follow Pastor Dave right over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.